Dear Professor Coker, on behalf of the International Society for the Comparative Study of Civilizations, I would like to welcome you to our annual conference entitled The Future of Civilizations at the historic and beautiful campus of Monmouth University. Multiple problems of the rapidly globalizing humanity have been for the first time identified and analyzed by the members of our society. Presently, the rapidly deteriorating global, geopolitical, socioeconomic, and sociocultural environment requires new approaches and paradigms. We are honored to offer our conference as a laboratory for their creation. My colleague Steven Sankevich and I are moderating a forum entitled Civilizations and International Relations Theory. Your participation in the work of the forum is crucial. As professor of international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and as author of multiple important scholarly works, you have made significant contributions to the studies of the sociocultural universe. Professor Christopher Coker, welcome to the Civilizations and International Relations Theory Forum. All right, uh, go right ahead, uh, Professor Coker. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to address you, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, let me get straight to the subject. Uh, what is this term civilization state and when was it first used? As far as I can trace, it was first used by Vladimir Putin in 2012 and subsequently the following year by the Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And at least two other countries have expressed an interest in the concept. One is India and the other is Turkey. So the first question is, what is a civilization state? Um, I will just make, mention three features. First, uh, it considers itself, it's a state that considers itself representative of the civilization and therefore superior to a nation state. Most nation states are less than 200 years old. Uh, civilizations are of course much older, China and India being perhaps the oldest of all. They consider that they're not bound by the rules, uh, international rules that were set up by the Western powers of the 19th and 20th centuries, especially by the great parvenu Western power, the United States, which dates back only to 1776. And both Chinese and Russians, but the Chinese more importantly, consider that they are uh, about to draw up a new set of rules that will change the terms uh, of international conduct. The second distinguishing feature is the service of the past in invocation of the present. Since 2012, China has seen itself as a Leninist Confucian state. Uh, Xi Jinping has talked about socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, Xi's brand of uh, Marxist nationalism draws on familiar ideas from Marxism of struggle and contradiction, but he's trying to go back further into the glories of China's past. He's trying to, as Kevin Rudd wrote in his recent book, stimulate the collective consciousness of an ancient people. So party officials are now expected to read Confucian texts. They're taught in China's schools and uh, Confucian lectures or lectures on Confucianism are now attended by regional party heads. And thirdly, and finally, there's what I call mandatory patriotism. You have to be patriotic and proud of your ancestors uh, and your country's past. So in the China, you have patriotic history courses that are now compulsory, that tell a new generation of Chinese children, tomorrow's leaders, about the century of humiliation that was visited upon them by the European powers in the 19th century, mostly in the form of at least two opium wars. By the way, the century of humiliation as a term was first coined in the 1930s. It was banned in Mao's China, where the theme of history books was uh, not nationalism, but class struggle. But since 1990, it's reinforced the victimization narrative, which enforces, I think is dangerous because it enforces a degree of resentment. And that resentment you clearly can see being uh, expressed at the moment in Russian policy towards Ukraine, the resentment of the loss of its superpower status. Which brings me to Russia, 
what is very specific then to the Russian debate and what is central to the Ukraine war, which we're seeing today. Well, back in February 2020, uh, a guru of, uh, of Putin's, no longer a guru, it has to be said, Vladislav Suslov, wrote that there is no Ukraine. There's only Ukrainism, which is a specific disorder of the mind. You can only reach that conclusion if you feel that you represent a civilization, not a state, and that Ukraine has always been part of that larger civilization. Putin, of course, wrote a very famous essay, 4,000 words, uh, calling uh, Ukraine an anti-Russian project. In many ways, this is a kind of rerun of the old 19th century debate of whether Russia was going to have a future defined by its Muscovite uh, destiny as an autocratic empire nation with its own distinctive collective forms of social organization, or whether it was on the road to convergence with the rest of Europe. Putin looked west when he came to power in 2000. He now certainly is committed to Eurasia. Uh, and this is part of the unlimited cooperation promised uh, between China and Russia at the beginning of the Ukraine war. Suslov himself uh, called Russia a half-breed uh, civilization, half Asian and half European. Unique, different, therefore a gang with its own distinctive rules. And then of course there is the importance of history which is being rewritten. Since 2013 uh, there are now a series of textbooks that are intended to eliminate the internal contradictions in the teaching of history. Uh, this is old Soviet language, internal contradictions, but it's used in a non-Marxist sense. It means the negatives of Russian history. Any criticism of Russian history is now banned from Russian history books. The former culture minister, Vladimir Bendinsky, uh, set out to create a Russian mythology. He said historians could not be trusted to get this mythology right. Therefore, many historians are now banned from access to the archives of Russian history because they're considered no longer to be myth spinners, but history writers. And in this version of history, who is the enemy? It's of course the West, the eternal enemy from the days of Alexander Nevsky through to the Great Patriotic War. The Great Patriotic War is now celebrated as the greatest event in 900 years of Russian history. Stalin is celebrated as the second greatest Russian after Putin the Great. And it's not surprising if that is your message that you're going to reprise the tropes of the great patriotic war, that you're going to accuse your enemies of being fascists and Nazis and accuse the Ukrainians of being traitors or the term that of course is preferred is unhealthy elements of the population. Finally, I would mention this Orthodox Christianity. The Christian church has always been very close to whoever has ruled uh, Russia it's extremely close today, and it helps uh, produce a narrative against Western decadence and Western depravity, against which the Russian people must be protected, particularly gay rights. And the Russian church, of course, has been unequivocal in its endorsement of the war in Ukraine, which the patriarch calls uh, a war between good and evil. So what does this all mean for geopolitics, uh, for the, in particular for the West's uh, position in the world. Again, I would uh, identify three uh, critical factors. The first is this is a rejection of Western pluralism. No more discussions about human rights violations in Tibet or now in Xinjiang against the Uyghurs. Those days when an American president would engage in these debates have gone for good. What is being preached is value pluralism. And it's based on the idea, not that there are different ideologies have different values, but the different cultures have different values. And the best that can be expected is mutual respect for each other's values. That has to be the basis of uh, a peaceful coexistence between cultures, a term again borrowed from the Cold War, where it was used specifically of ideological differences and now used specifically of cultural differences. But there's another message, which I think is even grimmer, and it was preached by Putin last year at the Valdai summit, where he goes uh, every year to uh, meet intellectuals and academics and journalists and discuss his views of the world, where he was very specific about 
how he sees the world differently from the Western powers. Uh, it's a world of disorder, not a world of order. And as he reiterated, the pandemic shows this. The fact that you can't predict pandemics, that we are living in a century of pandemics, as epidemiologists tell us, in the same way that the 20th century was a political century of war and revolution. This is a century that will be dictated and determined by natural uh, events as much as by politics. In this world of disorder, he says, we are at an advantage because we don't believe in order. We don't believe that peace is the natural default position of mankind. We believe that war and conflict is the natural default position of mankind. This is very different from the ideological message of the Soviet Union, which was that peace was the default mode, the socialist peace, the eternal peace that was on offer. Uh, and the offer of the Soviet Union made quite similar to the Americans in many ways of a new world order, a socialist new world order, of course, not a capitalist one, in which peace would be the norm. The Chinese, or at least I can only speak for Xi Jinping, buy into this as well. And if you look at the writings of Xi Jinping's guru, uh, Wang Hunang, you will find that they take very much to heart the writings of the most important science fiction writer in China today, Lu Xixin, and his trilogy of novels, particularly the second one, The Dark Forest, in which he tells us that the universe uh, is uh, 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 an environment in which conflict is the norm, in which matter is finite, not infinite, in which one alien species only advances at the expense of another, in which life is zero sum. So don't be surprised that the only German writer uh, to be taken seriously in uh, China today is not Karl Marx, but Karl Schmidt, because that's precisely the message that he was formulating back in the 40s and later in the 50s. And then finally, geopolitically, there is a return to 19th century spheres of influence, not political spheres of influence, uh, like the imperial powers carved out uh, between themselves, usually in agreement with one another, but cultural spheres of interest, what a former Soviet prime minister called spheres of privileged civilizational interest, which give Russia a right, in Russia's case, of veto over its neighbors. This is part of the justification for the invasion of Ukraine, that even if you accepted Ukraine was an independent state, it was in the Russian civilizational sphere of interest. And if you look at Russian national security doctrine from 2009, you will see that the Russian army is tasked with maintaining the spiritual security of Russian minorities who live in states outside the Russian Federation. So even back in 2009, uh, there was an emphasis on the return to 19th century geopolitics. So what has this got to do with international relations theory? Uh, let me emphasize that the civilizational state is a purely empirical, not theoretical concept, and it carries no definitive uh, theoretical charge. All I would say is that it's a debate that actually predates our present circumstances, it goes back to the discussions by Arnold Toynbee, amongst others in the 1930s, about whether the Soviet Union was a distinctive civilization. You may remember that even in the 50s, the Soviet Union was talking about a distinctive Soviet genetics that was distinctive from uh, Western science with terrible consequences, of course, for Russian agriculture. I would also mention that in the 1930s, the very first civilizational state appeared on the map. It was Imperial Japan, which made a very deliberate attempt from the mid thirties onwards to be distinctive from the nation state model that had been embraced uh, by an earlier Japanese regime uh, in the uh, mid 19th century. I think what this all means from my point of view, and it's a biased point of view, is that we go back to realism, but it's a more complex realism than you will find in the writings perhaps of John Mearsheimer, because it involves a large element of social constructivism as well. What we're talking about is social imaginary, a social imaginary that was identified a long time ago by one of the great writers on civilization in the 1920s, Petirim Sorokin, 
who argue that every civilization has, and I quote, a dominant attitude towards the nature of ultimate reality, what it thinks reality to actually be. There is a dominant uh, attitude in the Western world, which is the Western social imaginary. There is a dominant attitude now that is being forged by two political regimes in Russia and China. Um, my fear is that if they succeed in formulating them and they become popular, then we are facing the very real prospect of great power conflict, not great power competition, but great power conflict. And that was a theme I tried to address in the last book I wrote called Why War, which I would recommend you uh, might look at as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Coker, for that very enlightening talk.